Hey friends, it's your pal Mike Shea from Sly Flourish, here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy GM Prep. In this weekly show, I go through steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master while preparing for my Sunday D&D game. In this case, I am running a homebrew game in the Numenera world using the Cypher system. Numenera has its own system. The system was developed for Numenera called Cypher, and I've been running a campaign in it called the Fourth Empire, Rise of the Fourth Empire, the Fourth Emperor, Something like that. And it's an awesome time. I am really enjoying Numenera. I'm really enjoying the Cypher system. And I'm digging this campaign. Uh, yeah, so let's get started. Uh, so the, the this campaign all centers around uh, a band of heroes who happens to be at the wrong place at the wrong time when a very powerful entity known as the Fourth Emperor is returning to the planet, returning to Earth. The Fourth Emperor ruled some number of hundreds of millions of years ago and was so powerful this entity is so powerful it tried it succeeded in controlling all life on the planet it is one of a number of entities the other entities tend to just go and eat planets and eat life but this one was like what if i controlled it instead right and it came and it tried to control all life and it did so for millions of years and then was defeated by a mutation perhaps we're not really sure but an entity some or entity or entities or or something a plague known as the hex and the hex basically wiped it out and it ruled and created the fifth age of 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 the time period of the fifth age of the world for some number of millions of years and there's no recorded history of what happened during that period of time and then the sixth empire came around and that's when that's when people got excited about it so a really interesting thing that happened, the characters had been kind of navigating this situation of the rise of the fourth empire, the, the idea that the fourth emperor is returning. And the characters have been navigating this. And then they went to a place known as the Vault of Tacrin. And wh while they're engaged in a big fight with a big, crazy construct that likes to rip the ciphers, it will kind of rip your body open and see if you have any electronics inside. If you do, it'll take them. If it doesn't, you just throw it in the corner. Really nasty. Hey, my mom is here. My mom's here right when I'm talking about the giant machines that, that rip people open. Hi, mom. So, so they were fighting this thing, and they were like, this is really bad. And a guy used a Numenera. He used a cipher, a device that he had picked up earlier, and he didn't know what it did. And I didn't know what it did. And so like I rolled on the table and I saw what the cipher was. And then I rolled on the table to figure out what kind of cipher it was. And it turns out when he clicked it, it jumped him and the four characters that were with him, the three other characters that were with him, it jumped forward 14 months in the history of the campaign. They suddenly shifted 14 months in the future. And I saw that. And I was like, and this is in the middle of a game, right? And I'm like, oh man, what happens there? So I'm like, let's take, I, I, I said, we're doing it, right? Like I'm, I'm, I was excited for this. And I, I had them discover the fact that they were 14 months in the future. And then I ran upstairs and I said, let's take a break. And I ran upstairs and I'm like, what am I going to do? And I came up with like, yeah, I was able to sort of turn the dials and figure out, okay, these are what the things that were going to happen and what has happened, right? And it was really cool to progress the entire campaign, 14 months, instead of the fourth empire starting to like come out of the ground and starting to rise. They had taken over major parts of the world. They had taken over cities. They had occupied the characters' main cities. They had these huge devices known as skybreakers, which were starting to replace the oxygen and carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere with methane, right? They were trying to change the atmosphere of the entire planet. And that had happened so much so that they could smell it in the air. So I, I progressed a lot of the things forward and two of the players weren't even there. So I'm like, those two players actually spent the last 14 months doing stuff while the other four jumped, right? And today is the first day where those two characters are coming back into the game. So we got to figure that out. And so it really moved the progression of the entire campaign forward significantly. And it's wild. I love it, right? I love this idea. It's so much fun to, to just watch the story, just leap forward like that. I love it in fiction. I've, I've seen a bunch of shows and movies where they do this. And I, I always excites me whenever there's like a big time jump because it's like, oh, what happened? It's really cool. And the other, so the, the there was another, there was another important point I was going to make about that. I love the time jump. I love the progression. And the idea that two of the characters were, were there, today is the first day where they're coming back and we have to figure out what they did, right? So there's going to be a lot of like, let's talk to the players about what they think they've been up to, the two that were there. What have they been up to while this 14 month jump has been going, has been going on? And it means a lot of progress for, for the story. Oh, so there's been one bad part of this. There's one thing that I've, I was thinking about and I was like, eh, you know, it occurs to me. And that's that the idea of Numenera, the atmosphere of Numenera, one of the things that really excites me about Numenera is it's the, the wonder and the optimism that exists in the campaign, 
right? That it, it's, it, you're seeing wild stuff. Discovery and exploration is like the key of the thing. And seeing people that are kind of engaged in their daily lives with like hyper advanced technology they don't understand is really cool. But it's a very bright atmosphere. And then I turn it into this like incredible global holocaust, right? That I, I basically change it into this grim setting. And it's like, what did I do? You know, like, what's wrong with me that, <laughs> that I did this? And of course, the irony is, I also was super excited for Wild Beyond the Witchlight because I'm like, oh, thank God we're getting away from like Descent into Avernus and Rime of the Frostmaiden, these two really depressing adventures. And now we've got this wonders. And what do I do? I throw in dreadful incursions from Van Richten's guide. I throw in Ravenloft stuff because it's like, oh, I don't want it to be too bright and shiny. So, you know, I clearly kind of gravitate towards these sort of grim settings. But I want to be conscious of this because I want to drop in the exciting high fun high fantasy stuff i don't want it to just be this dark grim stuff right i don't i want to be careful about that so so we're gonna you know a lot of downward beats have occurred over the past 14 months i want to make sure that there's a lot of upward beats right i want to make sure that there's i want to bring back some of that wonder and excitement and fun and which i think is mostly going to be that the characters are going to make significant progress in figuring out how to do this i think we're still going to have a lot of fun I think we're still going to see a lot of neat things, but I want to push it towards back to that kind of wonder of exploration and optimism, right? I want to make sure to inject a lot of that back in because that's the fun of Numenera. And I'm like, I, I just turned into a post-apocalypse Dark Sun game, right? And I don't need a post-apocalypse Dark Sun game because I've, I can play those. So yeah, but it, but that's kind of like how the story went, right? I wanted to have this big enemy and then jump 14 months. It's like, well, if they haven't been opposed for 14 months, what's going to happen? So, so that's where we start. That, that's, that's something that has occurred to me over the past, over the past couple of weeks. We didn't have a game last week. Uh, we had a game the week before. So I'm going to... Let's get started. We will generate a session planning template. I am doing all of my campaign planning using Notion. If you want to learn more about Notion, you can see in the show notes below, there's a link to how to use Notion for campaign planning. There's also a link to this campaign's Notion notebook, so you can see all this stuff in action. But everybody often asks, hey, what notebook, what are you using to do this campaign planning? The answer is Notion. I love it. I've been using it for more than a year now. Really dig it. It's very smooth. It fits my style. Both my style has switched to support it, but it supports the lazy DM style very well. And I like it a lot. What's interesting is trying to use it for a home game. That's been very different for my for my witch-like game, for example, using Notion. I basically just keep it on a phone, and that works pretty well. Sunday. So we have six characters. One of them is out today. I can't remember which one is out. I know, I'm pretty sure that the two people who were out previously are both in, and that is Nakia and Cecilia. So we have Baiko. I think it might be Baiko who's out, but I can't remember. Or, I, I'm sorry, it might be Joe. I think Jad the Shade is out. So Baiko is an intuitive jack who rides the lightning. I actually still don't have a lot of background. He's always everywhere in the fray, you know, and, and I did some like sh some some stars and wishes, but I haven't, you know, has the worst luck with electrical devices and, and Baiko wants to help Nakia. So that's something we have. But I don't have a lot of background on Baiko. And, maybe, and it's okay. Some players don't, like, they're just, you know, no, I'm just having fun. I don't need to have, like, a deep background, deep story background. Other people like it. So, but I, but I want to make sure that they have the opportunity, that Pat has the opportunity to fill out Baiko's background. Cecilia has a very deep, deep and rich background. Cecilia comes from a race that, and her, her form changed. So that's, that's, that's kind of interesting. So uh, Cecilia is from a, a race, from a species that was around when the Fourth Empire was around. And whether or not this species was native and then got turned by the Fourth Empire into, into kind of a servile species or was gener generated by the Fourth Empire, I don't think they even know. I don't think anybody really knows, right? But what is known is that Cecilia's, her, the, the, the race that she comes from, which is sort of like an insecty kind of moth slash, you know, a moth slash like a, like a bee race, right? There's a name for it, like bees and wasps and stuff that they don't live. They, they have a certain lifespan. And after the lifespan, they, they kind of turn into something else and that something else might not be conscious, right? So, and, and she knew that it was about like, I think like 15 or 16 months that it was going to last. And now we've jumped 14 months, which means she has bodily transformed into a different visage of herself. And she's dying. She's going to die soon, right? And it, for her, it's like a natural progression. But it'd be nice if she could finish this thing that she started before she turns into this other thing. So she's got like a timer on it. And I think it's like three weeks. But I'm going to talk to the player and find out more about how long is Cecilia going to last? Because that's a big shift in, you know, that's a, a big shift in what's going on there. We have Jad the Shade, I think is played by Joe, who is out. He's a uh, meddlesome jack who exists partially out of phase. 
So he can f- that's handy for a carrot for a player that can't be there all the time is he can just phase out and we don't know where he is. Juniper, a cheerful nano who possesses a shard of the sun. Very optimistic, but I think she's starting to turn. Like there's so much stuff has happened over the past 14 matches. He's seeing this. The things are things are beginning to change. Right. And I think her optimism, you know, the cheerfulness is beginning to change. The other thing is like letting them change their 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 categories is interesting because the characters can evolve. It's sort of not quite multi-classing, but they can kind of shift their 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 descriptors, right? We have Nakia, Benef- beneficent 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 Jack, who acts without consequences, played by Jerry. Nakia, we haven't seen Nakia. For all we knew, Nakia and Cecilia were dead. We don't really know. But uh, we met Nakia's mother last session, and Nakia's mother's like, have you seen him? Like, you're back. We thought all of you had died, right? And you're back. Where is he? We, we don't know. Right, and I think maybe he's been hiding in the data sphere. Sam G one one three eight L, a protective glaive who fuses flesh and steel, played by Jay. Right, he is part of an army of machines that was made thousands, millions of years ago, or whatever, and he's one that's been released, and that's actually tying into a whole other campaign adventure, which we might tie to, and, and there might be some opportunities there. I think I think about this, there there might be some opportunities for like a future thing. So what's a jack? A jack is sort of like a rogue. A jack is sort of a mix between. A, a Jack is somebody who can kind of touch on like the the nanites of the world and kind of touch on the technology, but doesn't really understand it. Where nanos are more like wizards. So you can think of your you can think of Glaive as a fightery melee type. Your fighters, your paladins, and whatever. Uh, you have your nanos who are sort of like your wizards and clerics and stuff, and then you have your Jacks who are like your rogues and bards and stuff. That's an easy way to think of your your Jacks, your nanos, and we have four. I didn't realize it. we have four Jacks. That's pretty funny. A lot of Jacks, but of course our 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 the patron is a Jack. So the strong start, they are in the data sphere. Strange creatures, I have my voices. They're getting attacked. They're inside their crazy data sphere tank built by Takrin, right? Uh, Takrin is getting to be a really important NPC. I was thinking about this. And Takrin, so what is Takrin? Takrin's essentially a lich, right? Takrin is a 1,100-year-old being that used to be a humanoid and threw his skin and stuff away long ago and now floats around inside various data spheres, floats around, uses nanos, and he was basically a giant chrome skull sitting in a vault known as the Vault of Takrin, where he had a bunch of servants kind of making sure that he stayed alive. He is now broken free, and his goal, Takrin's goal, is to become either become part of the data sphere, the Fourth Empire's data sphere, or kind of ingests some of it i think he wants it so it's easiest to think of him like a, a power hungry lich but he doesn't want to like take over the world he just loves the data sphere stuff and it works in the character's favor because the characters are like we don't really care about the data sphere the, the fourth empire data sphere and and he's really powerful so one of the things that takran did takran has a bunch of different views right he can take over takran can can take over a physical body he can he can wear a skin and become like you know a, a, a kind of a walking chrome person he can also in the data sphere he appears like a like a quicksilver skeleton like a shifting skeleton think of like liquid metal terminator style and in the physical world he's often he's he's got a transmitter connected to his intellect which is sort of everywhere that looks like the skull of a terminator like the skull of a t800 terminator like the like the original terminator skull and it says things so it's like it's you know it's kind of a grim thing but no everyone's like oh yeah you know he's really helpful and one of the things he did is they went into the data sphere and he's like you know how do you want to ride in style and he built them like a tron tank so they have they're now riding around on like a tron tank through the data sphere while they're making their way to the the temple of faradon and that's really when we talk about where things go so they came back they they 14 months had leaped forward they found out that their town had been that the city that they were in had been occupied by agents of the fourth empire particularly these this race of creatures that was built by the fourth empire known as orgolians orgolians are like sort of half insect half reptile cybernetic beings that serve the fourth empire they're not the super smartest ones and they don't have any real good connection to nanos right so they need humanoids that already have an affinity for nanos the fourth empire needs people that already have an affinity for nanos to to do their bidding and the characters said okay well we want we, we know that kimley our friend kimley is a nano that's in their service we have this canister of anti-nanites which can break kimley's connection to the fourth empire but still keep kimley connected but bring her back to our side and if we could do that, that gives us a better inroads and access to the fourth emperor's data sphere so we can manipulate it. Because the only way for us to stop what's been going on is to do it in the data sphere. It's the only way we can do things at scale. And the scale is so big that they need to have this access. So they have the canister. One of the limitations of the point is you cannot take a canister full of nanites through the data sphere. It's too, 
it's too complex and the, the resolution of the data sphere will destroy them. That turns them into sand. So they have to, they're, so they're keeping the data, they're keeping that in their secret lab, which they have underneath the town of Badrav, this, their hometown. They have a vertex, which is a way to interface in and out of the data sphere. And it's like Tron, it eats your whole body. So your body disappears, you go into the matrix, you go running across, you go into the data sphere, you can re reincarnate, re reinstantiate, they call it real casting. You real cast back in the real world, at which point you're rebuilt molecularly, then you're physical again, and they can go back the same way. So their plan is, they have a plan, and their plan is go into the data sphere, make their way to the Temple of Faradon, crack the Temple of Faradon so they can get inside, data cast, a real cast back in, find Kimli, grab her, hit her with a, a sock full of quarters, grab her, data cast back into the vertex, blow up the vertex on the way out so nobody can follow on the way out, make their way back to Badrov, to their secret lab, real cast back in Badrov with Kimli when the, they knocked out with a sack of quarters, then use the nanites on, the anti-nanites on her and get her back to her side, right? Seems like a good plan. I, I like it. It's a fun, it's a heist, right? This is a cool heist-based adventure. And I love, there's like types of adventures that I gravitate towards. I love heists and I love not dungeon crawls, but I love running dungeons. Dungeon, the, thinking about dungeon crawl is an interesting thing. That's a whole topic for another day. But like what makes a crawl? What's the crawl part? Is that like the poke the steps for the every five feet? That's boring. And, and it's really interesting to see lots of people who are like, I either love dungeon crawls or hate them. I'm like, I love them. Like to me, they're nice. They're focused. I know where they're going. I can add all kinds of things. I love them. Whenever I can run a dungeon crawl, I'm really happy. But then there's other people who go, oh God, I hate them. They're so lame and they're so boring. And it's like, well, what are we doing in the dungeon crawl that's making them lame and boring? What am I doing that's making them at least exciting for me? And really my players don't seem to mind them. They Sometimes they do, very rarely. I've, I've run some of the worst adventures I've ran with dungeon crawls. And it was because it was that pacing and it was all downbeats. And I learned a lot from that. Boy, that one that one adventure I ran twice that sucked, I learned a lot from that. I wonder if I learned, I probably learned what are quarters and what's a sock? Yeah, it's a. it's like a, I, I probably still have socks, right? I think socks probably lasted a billion years in the future. You still need to wear something on your feet. Uh, and there's probably a bag full of shins, right? So they're inside their crazy data sphere tank built by Takran the Excagate, and they are facing some creatures. This is the book Voices in the Data Sphere. Voices in the Data Sphere is a whole Numenera source book just based on data sphere stuff. They have foot, foot covering nanites. Exactly. Uh, I think frame creepers, I think this is the frame creepers that, did I skip the frame creeper already? It's a frame breaker. That's a frame. It's not a frame creeper. There were these like weird triangle, triangles. These guys, engines, right? Uh, triangular red creatures. They're only level three, so there's not a lot of them. And I was going to have a whole host of these things. So we're going to have uh, getting attacked by engines. And then during the engines, I think we're going to have a couple of those big things. Frame breaker. Frame breakers are cool. The an, a, a few abstracts, like maybe, you know, a handful of abstracts. We have three abstracts, four abstracts. One blows up and and we see... Nakia and, and Cecilia chasing the abstracts. Nakia and Cecilia learned about the return of our other heroes when they crossed out into the wilds of the data sphere on their way to the temple of Faradon. Right, so we want to introduce the characters. And then I think, you know, we're, we're right. So so first is engine battle. And that's going to be like learning how to use the tank, right? The reintroduction, the, the abstracts. And then Nakia, reintroduction of Nakia and Cecilia. Then breaking into the uh, temple, Faradon data sphere. Right. And then the heist, the Kimli heist. Then return to Badrav. Save Kimli. Save the world.
that's probably good for this session and probably a few sessions after it. So we're, 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 we're already, I've got my strong start. I've already got some, a bunch of scenes planned out. So what are some of the secrets and clues? So, oh boy, I got so many of these, right? There are six geosynchronous. I don't know how to spell geosynchronous. That's not right. I'm just going with geosync. There are six geosynchronous satellites owned in the hacker speak by the fourth emperor. And it's really owned by the fourth emperor's, what are they called? Heralds. These six, so we need a cool name for these. So we already have skybreakers, so that doesn't work. I want a fun name for these things. They are, oh, thank you. Nicole, you're so kind. Except, I, why can't I copy the text? There we go. Nicole, you're a lifesaver. Look at that geosynchronous. Yay. How, how, how can anybody spell that? How did anybody spell that before they were spell checking? That's ridiculous. So, there's, there's satellites. There's six geosynchronous satellites to cover each part of the world. So, they can cover the entire planet with three satellites. But they have three they have three others. And one of the things that these satellites do is they, they communicate. These six satellites allow communication between all heralds. The satellites also, could it be like the eyes, the eyes of the fourth, the eyes of the fourth? Could that be it? Could we call them the eyes of the fourth? The eyes of, of God. That's a little bit, that's a bit much. The, the emperor's crown. Not a terrible metaphor, but they also, they, they see the web of heralds. These satellites, a sky eye, hmm. the eyes, I think we're going to go with the eyes of the fourth, allow communication between all the heralds of the fourth empire. The satellites also have a number of inert missiles, like bombs, I guess. They're kind of like bombs. They can drop uh, hyper, they can drop on locations and blow things up beholders the crown of eyes the satellites have a number of inert missiles so the idea is like imagine you have this like rod of tungsten that's weighs a few thousand pounds right and you have a way to fire it with such high velocity that when it hits the ground it's like the equivalent of a nuclear bomb without the radiation right and and they can blow up entire you know it creates super powerful blasts that can that, that that you know can can destroy entire towns and they've used them they've used them before so they have a number of these but there's a limited number they have a limited number of them right and and they don't try to use them unless they actually need them they use them to demonstrate that they can the heralds have their own and there's a name for it in if we look at the the terminology here one of the things that Voice of the Data Sphere does is it adds a bunch of terminology. Is it the glossary? Travels restricted between two places in data. So some will cry a little more. Be froze. So barriers, they have their own barriers. I don't know. Barriers isn't a very cool name. Entry frame, Evo. Their own doors. We're going to call them doors. I like door better than barrier, right? They have their own doors. Only they can enter. No mortals, no sentience have direct access to a herald to a herald's node data sphere node right node i think is sort of like a, a location in a data sphere node a large data space a node may be one continuous space or because of multiple connected or isolated frames and the frame data space within a node frames have so they're like a room so Think of a node as like a dungeon and a frame as a room and then conduits are like hallways. That's kind of an easy way if we're going to use a dungeon metaphor, which is nice because that means there's some solidity to this idea. So uh, no sentience have direct access to a herald's data sphere node, but so it needs to be cracked. Only one known entity and we're going to was able to break into... Only no, one known entity was able to break into a herald's node, the hex, right? The hex managed to break in. I, I'd like to offer, so, so when we think about the structure of this, I'd like to offer multiple ways though. Like what, what is, so one way is that like back, back when the fourth empire was around and there were heralds back then too, the heralds were defeated 
by by the hex. So we know that the hex can crack them. Is there another way? Is there another another way to break? Oh yes, the breakers. So uh, this is a good secret. Oh, and by the way, I'm I'm stealing inspiration from a few different places. But w Tron is definitely Tron and Tron Legacy. Fantastic movies. Uh, good inspiration. Uh, a lot of my cyberspacey data sphere stuff I'm stealing directly from Neuromancer and Count Zero and probably Mona Lisa Overdrive, which I'm reading. I'm rereading right now. I just listened to the the radio play. There's a free radio play for Numenera BBC Radio that they did a long time ago. It was really really fun. Uh, and then I said I like this so much I want to read Count Zero. So now I'm listening to the audiobook of Count Zero and I'm using a lot of their terminology and their ideas about cracking mainframes and AIs that'll kill you and all kinds of cool stuff. And definitely the inspiration, a lot of the inspiration from Data Sphere came from that. And then another one is, I, you know, I keep falling back to my good old Stephen King in the Dark Tower series and the, the idea of the breakers, right? And later later books have these very powerful telepaths who are being used to sort of break the the, the lines that are, are holding the world together, break break the, the, the ley lines that are holding the world together, or the universe together, really. So, so I'm using that. But the idea that like the, so let's see, the, the fourth empire has been rounding up nanos to fuel their skybreakers. Nano, nanos are the only ones able to program the nanites required to break the sky. This the town of uh, Scarlet of Scarlet Watch had a large number of nanos who were rounded up and brought to the temple, one of the other temples. Not Slyandar? Let's take a look at Slyandar. I thought Slyandar was the temple. I don't know if I have anything about the Temple of Slyandar. We're going to have the Temple of Slyandar, right? Why not? After all, why not? Why shouldn't I keep it? Where they are being, where they're connected to the fourth emperor data sphere to program nanites. So that offers two options. One, you can go and get the hex, right? And, and if you go to the archive, let's see, a sample of the hex is kept in the sixth, kept by, kept in the tomb of the sixth archivist, right? A sample of the hex is kept in the tomb of the sixth archivist. The secrets today, I'm not having a lot of trouble with these, that's for sure. So that offers a couple of different paths. If our heroes could gain control of an eye of the fourth, they could, you know, drop tungsten bombs anywhere in this hemisphere. That's a handy thing to have, including blowing up multiple, what are they called? Skybreakers. It may be worth investigating a skybreaker to understand how they work and figure how to shut them all down. The skybreakers reside on their own layer of the FE data sphere. So yeah, you can take control of an eye of the fourth and that gives you access to a very powerful orbital weapon that you can use however you want to do it. But only the heralds, I think this is a secret, right? Only the heralds have access to the, the let's see, satellites, limited number of inner missiles. The heralds have their own doors. Yeah, so another secret here is that only the heralds have access to the eyes of the fourth. That looks like 10 secrets. Fantastic location. This is pretty easy. Uh, we have the Temple of Faradon. We probably also want to have a fun cyberspacey location. So as part of this, I made a uh, a new uncovered secret. I, I, is this? I don't think this is published yet for patrons. This will be published for patrons this month. 
Uh, so this month in uh, Sly Flourish's Uncovered Secrets Volume 2, which are sort of uh, one page, more one-page guidelines and kind of inspiration to help you with your various RPGs, I've been doing a lot of like, you know, things that don't fit the core fantasy style there. And one of them, let's see if I can find it, is a cyberspace. Let's see here, a cyberspace generator. Bring up a new window. So this is the idea um, having, and I need, where are my dice? There are my dice. Things you might find while lurking around in cyberspace. Probably not something you would drop into your D&D game, but you never know. And certainly other games. So let's get a bunch of D20s. So let's have a place that they're going to run into, a, a feature that they that they can find in sort of the middle. They're sort of in this open plane, this the, the areas between the nodes, right? It's sort of the wastelands of the data sphere. And they're riding across on their big cyber tank, their big Tron, Tron tank. And they come to an asteroid surface. Oh, so the location has this, you know, area where it's broken apart. This is cool, right? Oh, I never have enough room for everything on my desk. So sort of like imagine an area where like the grid has cracked and is broken and there are like holes to infinity an aged cracking form of the grid that's cool then we have some features let's let's roll up a couple of features right a two and a 16 a half deleted entities that works and 16 a crashed glider right cool so some cool stuff to see there. Any kind of interesting environmental effect? 15 is uh, floating liquid spheres, right? This is very cool. Are there any inhabitants? These are sort of non-monstrous. 18, monstrous simulation. What would a monstrous simulation be? Something that they would see. I guess we could just roll kind of on this thing, right? We'll have the corpse, right? Some kind of beast. Data, they described in. So this is just sort of a place. I don't really need a fight here, but I just want to have a location they might be able to stop and they can sort of hang out and reconnect as characters and they could be in this kind of spot, right? And I like the idea that it's like, and maybe this place needs a name, right? Like, oh, what would be a cool name for this place? Just like a location, a sort of lost location, right? The lost square, the tears. We could have a, beast let's let's go into numenera and we'll go into bestiary I'll go to bestiary three and let's find a great big monster what if it was a how about the the, the giant simulation could be a uh what are those things called that that big ass monster this guy what's that thing called that's in the core numenera book it's really pretty evocative i mean let's it, you see it all the time Dread Destroyer, right? And we'll call it the World Killer, right? The dead, so corpse, the bones of the World Killer. So then they're going to, so they, they, you know, they're traveling across, they get into the Temple of Faradon and a lot of what is gonna be, so the Masta Gophers are now there. I think I can use a lot of the same monsters and things like this, only there's going to be more of them now. But I think I've got this pretty set up, which is like they're going to appear in this lower room with the three stars. That's where the vertex is. Probably on that central stage is where they're working on the machine. There's probably a bunch of people, nanites, that are in those 10 chambers. They've reconstituted those chambers and they're now using they're now using them as mini mini breakers, right? They're and they're actually trying to rebuild this facility. They're trying to get the engine working that was destroyed the last time the characters were here. The characters slowed everything down significantly when they blew things up. So but there's a, a couple of master gophers, there's a bunch of Araglian soldiers, and we have both so NPCs. We have Kimley. We have what's her name? Sinad. We have of course, we have uh, Terrence. Whoops, come on. The thing with Terrence is, is kind of fun. So Terrence, it, it actually, this is something that happened in the last game and it worked out really well, which is they had learned that Terrence died, that he was during, during kind of the uh, occupation of Badrav, he was disintegrated. And the last words he said to, to his friends were, don't worry about it. And then he was disintegrated. And then the characters went down and they found, I actually rolled for a cipher and they found this headband that was like some headband that did something. And I was like, the headband is rigged up to this weird like Sony Walkman tape deck. 
And it turned out that inside the Sony Walkman tape deck was a full copy personality of Terrence that he had copy, he put the headband on and it, and it made a full copy of his like neural pathways. And now he can be connected to either an individual or to the data sphere. He's dead, but there's this copy of his persona. And so they brought that with him. And now Terrence the Explorer is sort of back again. And I think there's a lot of fun conversations between Tacron and Terrence. Because Terrence is still very much like a normal sentient humanoid. Where Tacron has spent 1,100 years as a, as a free-floating personality. So he doesn't really have, you know, he doesn't really have it. So I think that that is, that is really neat. So in the temple, Kimli and Sanad are ruling, are, are commanding the other nanos to rebuild the temple and get the engine back fired up again, the thing that can get, can connect and, and do stuff because it was destroyed last time. They're, they're still working out. They're probably getting close. And, you know, they're going to hit her with a sock full of shins and then grab her up. So monsters, the monsters are, let's see, we had a couple of data sphere. So when, they, so, so when they're traveling across, there's guards at the doors, right? What would the, what would the creatures that are guarding the when they get to, I guess that's the bottom of the thing. Uh, when they get to the door that's guarding the Temple of Faradon, they can crack this door. It's probably a level five door, right? Maybe it's a level six door. So we'll put this in locations, right? Doors of Faradon. Uh, level six, right? Cracking them is level six. Protected by... Probably a couple of big things, right? A couple of big... Zevs would be pretty cool. Yeah, these are pretty cool. They're cool and alien and weird. And this Zevs are in... 262. The keeping keep peacekeeping force of Chi. But I think this will serve. And 262 of Discovery. Right? So they have to get past the Zevs and then crack the door and that will get them in into the temple do these monsters have stat blocks the cool thing is so yes this is their stat block right this is it this is what a stat block looks like and 515 is pretty much the only number you need to know this is why i love numenera stat block so much because that tells you pretty much everything these guys actually have a little bit more hit points but you can just stick with their level five what does that mean it means you have to beat a 15 or better to hit it they attack as a, with a 15 or better to defend against it they do five points of damage in this case it looks like they do a little bit more and sometimes you might have them do like multiple attacks like i probably give these guys you know two attacks each i don't think i'm going to do this net stuff i think it's just going to be a straight a straight thing so yeah then they get into the temple temple of Faradon via the vertex and then they're set so that's pretty good. Monsters, I'm not, I don't really need a monster list, I don't think, because I have it elsewhere. So we're going to get rid of that. Treasure, I love rolling on the treasure table directly, so I don't really need to have a treasure. So yeah, so for today, I think I'm set. But I want to talk about, so that gives us a little bit of extra time. You know, I feel like I've got everything I need. And the cool thing is things are really starting to come together. But when I think about a potential path that this campaign can go, I have these... I have these sort of like other little side, my idea jar, right? I wonder when I wrote this, go to weapons cache to arm themselves for coming battles. I think they don't really need a lot of this. This is old stuff. So we're going to create a new, new stuff. And this is 24 April. So when I think about the path that this could go, I'm thinking about how you essentially traverse these layers. So, right. So, so they're going to crack uh, the temple Faradon. One idea I have that I really, a, an, a piece of imagery that I want to drop in here that I think will be really fun is once they grab Kimli, once they escape out of the vertex, they blow up the vertex on the way out. And on their way out, I think the, they're going to see the, they're going to see the Herald rise up into the air a little bit. And then a, one of those tungsten bombs is going to blow up the whole temple. And their thought is like, they don't want to lose a nanite. They don't want a. They don't want one of their nanites compromised, right? They would rather blow the whole place up than 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 have a compromised nanite. So as soon as they find out that one of them has a, or is on the way out, they're gonna blow the place up. I just think it's a cool image. The Kimli heist, the, the Fe. Oh, let's see, Faradon blows up the temple. This destroys it completely, right? It's kind of a cool image. And, I, and that's one I got right from Count Zero. There's a scene in Count Zero where they're they're doing an extraction for somebody. And 
the extraction goes so bad that one of it's two companies. It's a, it's like a lead scientist for one company that's defecting to another company. And the first company, when they see that they're losing their lead scientist nukes, the whole location where the extraction was going to take place. And they just bit one dude makes it one dude. And the person extracted are the only two people that make it out. And I just love that idea that like a company would rather section of the desert that, that where the extraction took place, than lose one of their, one of their key, you know, key researchers. So I think that that is pretty cool. So when we think about where they might go, where's my, oh, I have this like new stuff. Oh yeah, I guess I renamed the, I renamed the page. So crack the Temple of Faradon, right? Crack, find a way to crack Faradon themselves. And there's two paths for that. Get a hold of the breakers from Scarlet Watch. Is that not scripting a scene? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, if it, but I'm I'm not only hanging on loose, right? Maybe something could, be, but like the the players already have their plan. It's their plan that they came up with, and their plan is to grab Kimley and get out. And I think if they, my my assumption is they're going to be able to accomplish that plan. And then the idea that Faradon blows up the Temple of Faradon with a tungsten bomb seems cool, and it seems likely that might happen. And it doesn't actually hurt the characters. They were already getting out right but i just love the idea that like man you know so i don't think that that's too i don't think i'm hanging on too tight with that one because it's not hurting it's not directly affecting the characters the characters succeed right and having the temple blow up behind them is just kind of a cool bit of background right it doesn't matter to them in fact they're happy that that happened but it shows how it shows how the fourth empire and how the other how the heralds are thinking about this Right. Get a hold of the breakers from Skylight. So they have two different ways. Get the get a hold of the breakers or get the Quang Mark Seven from the Hex. Get the what is this? This is called a Herald Breaker at the six. I'm stealing the Quang Mark Seven directly out of Neur Neuromancer, where they have a Chinese military virus known as the Quang Mark Four uh, that is an AI killer. And I love that idea. So I'm, we're just going to steal that directly and call it the Quang Mark 7. What else? So, so those are two possible ways. Then they crack Faradon, crack and own Faradon. Once they have access to Faradon, crack and own one of the eyes, right? That's certainly a path. Then they, they own, so then crack and own a Skybreaker. Use the eyes to destroy the other skybreakers. And at that point, will they have deconstructed? So how do they, how will they have, they'll want to like disable the other heralds. That's really important, right? Disable the other, disable our own, right? The other eyes. Destroy the... I know I used Crash before, but I think I'm going to do it again. Of the Fourth Empire. Is that how you spell Crash? So one thought is, like, do they... I mean, we could have, like, a dare, right? Face the Fourth in the outside. In the... And the beyond, right? Is it beyond or outside? I can't remember. I think the beyond is the region, right? So... That might be sort of the dare zone, right? Like they they might be able. This is this is one of those where like, are you going to force something too much? And am I forcing it too much to like force a fight against the fourth emperor? So if they if they manage to find out where the crash of the fourth emperor is, this is where the emperor is going to be transcribing, <coughs> you know, sort of data real casting in from both the data sphere and from the outside, and they just blow it up with a tungsten bomb. Why do they need to face him, right? So there may be this like, you know, well, you can always take the fight to him, right? You can enter his zone. You won't be able to bring your fancy ass eyes with you, but you can go in there. Or do you think that you've stopped it enough that it's not going to take place again, right? It could probably for this generation, but what about the next generation? What about another million years from now? There's only one way to really get rid of him, right? So that might be like a fun thing to do at the end. So... So I think that that might work. Yeah. 
so I'm gonna, I mean, we're going to keep going with these, but these, these, this is not, it's not exactly an outline. It's just sort of like an idea of stuff that they might do, right? And things that they might go to. And I saw some questions about like, how long is this campaign to go? And realized I don't really know. I'm not sure how long this campaign is going to go. So hard, hard to say. I want to thank everybody for hanging out with me today while I prep my game. I feel good. I'm excited about this campaign. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be an interesting channel because we're going to see how this works. But I want to thank everybody for hanging out with me today. And next week, we'll see how things went. And we will keep pre we will prepare for our next game. If you've enjoyed this show, you can help me out in four ways. You can subscribe to this Life Flourish newsletter. You can support me directly on Patreon. You can subscribe to my videos on YouTube. Or you can pick up any of my books. Thank you all very much. Have a great day. And get out there and play a role-playing game.